and welcome to January's CE for Shreveport Fire Department. We're going to be covering RSI and pre-hospital antibiotics. This presentation was actually presented at the LSU Regional Trauma Symposium and I've adapted it for Shreveport Fire. We're going to be learning a little bit more about RSI, learning about pre-hospital antibiotics, why we should, why we shouldn't do certain things. So I hope you enjoy this month. So like I mentioned before, the first topic is going to be a research project that we did at Ochsner. And what we did was we used another one of our county or parish services to uh, see if their antibiotic administration was efficacious. It did uh, have good outcomes with patients, as well as what was the results of the antibiotic administration once we got to the hospital. The second one is RSI. It's a hot topic. Some states do it, some states don't. And we'll see why and why we shouldn't do things. During the last several decades, EMS systems have emerged as an important component in how we manage patients with life-threatening illnesses and injuries. So evidence has been brought up from the antibiotic administration in the pre-hospital setting and has determined that giving antibiotics in the field is effective. And this quote here, I should say word advanced, is really not appropriate. It's just a medical protocol because the only thing that can really happen when you give antibiotics in an acute setting is anaphylaxis and we can treat that in the ambulance. So it's not a big deal. Um, what was once thought of an expanded disaster protocol has now become a course of action that's been built into hospital and pre-hospital setting administration. And it extends to trauma and even to sepsis. Although with sepsis, that's usually found with the flight medics because of the fact that with sepsis, you have to give different antibiotics for different problems if you have pneumonia versus trauma versus sepsis. So although um, antibiotic administration in sepsis has been extensively documented, the data related to specific antibiotic administration for penetrating trauma injuries is still kind of lacking. So what we did was we just tried to do a preliminary hands-on retrospective evaluation and because of the fact that EMS personnel are the first to assess and treat the majority of penetrating traumas, making sure that you start that early goal-directed medical treatment in the field is super important, just because of the fact that with trauma, you have the golden hour. And mentioning other things that you have golden time periods for, with sepsis, you have within the first hour for antibiotics and the first three hours for fluid resuscitation. With strokes, you have those first four hours that you need to get things done for thrombolytic um, compliance and making sure they're candidates for it. With our STEMIs, you know, making sure that door to balloon time is very important. And then obviously with trauma, you have the golden hour. And so there's a lot of hours that we have because statistically shown that every minute that you wait after that, you increase morbidity and mortality for the patient. So what were the results of that study? Well, this research was limited, limited by the population size that we had, and we only had 29 patients. So 28 of the 29 patients actually received the pre-hospital antibiotics, also received a duplicative dose whenever they arrived into the trauma bay, um, which indicates that we need to communicate better, and we'll talk about the next slide. But more importantly, the initial goal of that study was to see, does antibiotics in the field actually reduce infections? And although we couldn't draw statistical correlation just because we didn't have enough people, what we did find was that the people that did get antibiotics were less likely to have had an infection. Now, there were a lot of distractors because of the fact that the antibiotics were duplicated and sometimes changed whenever they got to the ER. But what we did see was is that the people that did get infections had catastrophic traumatic injuries. Um, there was a train accident. There was a, another accident where the patient was gored. And so therefore, the risk of infection was very high just because of the mechanism of injury. So what is the, the main point here that we can draw out of this from the pre-hospital setting? Well, when a patient arrives to the trauma bay, we all know that there's a verbal and physical handoff between the trauma team and EMS. There's a lot of different players in that room. There's the head of the bed, there's the nurse at the foot, there's the nurse at the head, there's the trauma doctor, there's the trauma residents, there's the ER residents, there's the nursing staff, there's the techs, and the list goes on. Sometimes there can be upwards of 15 to 20 people in that room, and you have the opportunity to hold the room while you are giving report. And so one of the things that we used to do um, five, 10 years ago, and excuse me, this is not the correct terminology, but it's really the, the best way I can describe it at the moment. But when you would bring a patient into the trauma bay, you would keep the patient on your bed and you would essentially hold them hostage on that bed just for, an, just for a minute so that you can get the attention of everyone in the room. With the development and the recommendations now of moving the patient over onto the stretcher, 
now that hostage time has been replaced with you having to fight for attention. And so making sure that you give a concise review of medications and therapy performed prior to arrival is very important. And sometimes you must be able to direct and control the room, which is hard for some people, especially with a lot of people that have alpha personalities in that room. You must control the room for at least 15 to 30 seconds while you give your very important report. However, what we did see in this uh, documentation in this re research that we did, the number of duplicative efforts surrounding antibiotic administration indicates that maybe the trauma services are unfamiliar with antibiotics in the pre-hospital setting. Maybe they felt that they didn't, that you didn't give it the right way. Maybe they felt that you didn't actually give it. Who knows? But what it does show is that we need to be able to educate our hospitals, um, our hospital colleagues in the e capabilities that EMS can do. Because sometimes the medical staff may not even realize that EMS has administered these antibiotics during transit, which was supported by our findings. Communication training with trauma services and the emergency department staff will help make this get better and hopefully resolve this deficiency, as well as preventing duplication of antibiotic administration. So what were the conclusions? Although the study was observational only and could not draw precise conclusions, what it did show was is that the uh, antibiotic administration was duplicated. And it noted that there's a communication disparity between EMS and the hospital staff. This can represent an unnecessary monetary expense for EMS agencies. Although it's not a, a huge impact on the budget, it's still an impact as well as the dangerous health issue that undermines a prominent tenant of modern healthcare, which is stewardship of um, antibiotics so that we don't breed superbugs. Unless the pre-hospital and hospital providers develop an effective strategy to improve that communication, it's likely the problem will persist, placing additional financial burdens on the EMS agencies, as well as possible poor patient outcomes due to the fact that the patient's getting double the dose. So let's go into a patient scenario here. We have John Doe, age 23, that was impaled by a rebar after flipping his ATV during a high-speed joust race in a rural heavy brush area. You are in the city. You do have helicopter access if necessary. Your closest facility is about five minutes away and your closest um, trauma one is eight minutes away. So what do you want to do? What are you thinking about when you get to the call? So some of the things that you need to think about flipped from his ATV, high risk, cervical spine mobilization, CT and L spine concerns, rebar that has been impaled. And if dispatch says impaled, you must be worried. That's a, that's a big word. Um, and so impaled where? Through the abdomen, through the chest, through the leg? Those things do change things a little bit. If you go through the parts that have more things within, you're going to have risk of problems um, in the future. All right, so let's talk about the patient's primary survey. This is gonna include the PHTLS X, A, B, C, D, E model, which is exsanguination. That's where the X is, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So when you do the exsanguination and pretty much when you do the primary survey, it should take you less than a minute or two. This is meant to identify immediate life threats. And that's all that this is in order of um, severity. So. When you see the exsanguination, you need to do a blood pat, take your gloves, start from the head or the top of the head and go around the head, go down the neck, go down the front, go down the arms, go down the pelvis, go down the legs. And periodically you're checking your gloves for any blood. And when you do see blood, you just put a bookmark in your mind to go back to that area. So the exsanguination here is obvious bleeding from the chest and back, some bubbling at the back. Airways, patient states his name, breathing, patient has absent breath sounds on the right. And anytime you confront a positive finding here that you can do a critical action on, you must stop and you do that critical action. So this patient will need to have a um, pneumodart or a um, uh, needle decompression performed on the right side. You also might want to consider, since there's bubbling coming out of the rebar holes, to put in some um, occlusive dressing around that in order to plug up that hole so that your needle decompression does work. Where would you do it? In the front, in the fourth or fifth mid-axillary anterior space, no longer the second or third um, mid-clavicular. Uh, now we have circulation, checking the pulses, radial. When you get them fully exposed, you can check the dorsalis pedis on the feet. But remember, since this rebar is going through where the vessels come through for that right arm, you might want to also make sure that you differ between the pulsations on the left and the right arm. 
disability. The patient didn't have any CT or L spine, but they do have back pain and chest discomfort for that rebar sticking out of them. And then the exposure, you see the rebar. And here's what that looks like. As you can see, the patient's laying in the left lateral recumbent. You've exposed the patient to the best of your ability. You most likely will need to remove the underwear as well. And we can see here that the rebar is jutting out from underneath his right clavicle out through his um, right scapula. And there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go through that nerves, arteries, veins, um, the brachial plexus is around there at the root of the brachial plexus. And so you have a lot of potential for damage for this patient. Um, definitely needs to go to a level one trauma center. So what's our preliminary field diagnosis? Well, we can see that the patient has a penetrating injury with the wound um, still kind of exposing the interior to the outside with the bubbling from what was noted before. We also have the intact form body present. And so we need to make sure that we address this um, with stabilization, address the absent breath sounds or else you have a strong likelihood of developing um, tension pneumothorax, which would put this patient into a very a much more difficult predicament if he stopped breathing or his heart stopped. Um, because you have to think about what would happen if this patient arrested right now? What would you do? How could you do CPR? You can't put, you, you could do manual CPR should you put the Lucas on. A lot of things could be avoided just by doing best practices and addressing the primary steps. So what tests do we need to do? Well, I would suggest that we would get the patient on the IV. We'd have vital signs. We'd put the occlusive dressing, especially if you see bubbling around the wound. You want to do the needle decompression. I would even suggest doing a 12 liter. I know it sounds silly, but since the rebar did go through the box, as we like to call it, or the area where the great vessels in the heart are, who's to say that the patient didn't have a cardiac contusion? He did, he was ejected from a ATV, rolled and has been impaled. So that brings into the trauma's perspective. You need to put the patient on a seat collar. How are you going to put the patient flat in order to maintain cervical spinal mobilization? You can't. The rebar is preventing you. Do you pull the rebar back? That rebar is ribbed, and so whenever you pull it back, you're going to increase the risk of further image and, or, um, damage. So this would be a thing that you would need to say, you know, unable to perform certain things due to the um, obstruction of your care. And so your documentation becomes very vital with this. Um, making sure you do Q5 vital signs, maybe consider a fluid bolus, and then periodically checking those lung sounds and uh, the patient's status, blood pressure, and heart rate to make sure that your needle decompression is working. If not, you need to do another one. What's the determination? Absolutely level one. So the antibiotics that we can use in the pre-hospital setting are cefazolin or ANCEF or recephin or ceftriaxone. Those are the two names for each. And you can see they can both be given IM or IV. The dosage is pretty much the same, but recephin covers more and it's cheaper because you don't have to give it as often. And so uh, this would be a great opportunity um, to implement something because remember we talked about when seconds count, antibiotic administration for traumatic injuries is one of those timers that we keep track of for core measures. Here's a um, brief protocol for recephin. You can see here it's open fractures, gunshot wounds, penetrating trauma. Um, the only contraindication to it is hypersensitivity to cephalosporins, which is the class of antibiotics that this belongs to. And you'll see here that it can cause anaphylaxis, but we can treat that in the ambulance. So it's a reconstituted, you put, um, it comes in a powder form, put 10 cc's of sterile water in there, shake it up and um, administer it. You put it in a hunter bag and you run it, or you can even give it IM. Let's move on to rapid sequence innovation. So um, although the technique of RSI has evolved, the indications for RSI has remained essentially unchanged for many years. And the aims of a rapid sequence innovation or sometimes delayed sequence innovation or sometimes chemical sedation is to deliver anesthesia with mass, rapid muscle relaxation, achieve rapid innovation to prevent aspiration of the gastric contents into your lungs. And so many indications for the RSI outside the OR have been categorized using airway and breathing because that's really what it's about. And that's in trauma and in medical, cal medical calls. So like mentioned before, these criteria are indicated for a patient in acute respiratory failure due to inadequate oxygenation or they can't be ventilated appropriately and for airway protection in patients with altered mental status. This method is utilized by clinicians across medical specialties, including critical care, anesthesiology, as well as us in the pre-hospital setting. Now let's talk about RSI and how we would apply it in a pre-hospital setting. So the evidence reporting intubation success rates and complications 
by provider type is actually of low quality and with considerable differences between systems, with, which makes it really difficult to establish norms because in the pre-hospital setting, we're not as regimentalized as the hospital setting when it comes to data reporting. And so two meta-analysis actually established evidence that showed that if you don't do continuing ongoing training, then you have demonstrated significantly higher failed intubation rates and adverse effects for non-physicians when compared to physicians who do go through that training. This is likely to reflect experience and often low numbers of intubations per provider. And although we do roughly 30 to 35 intubations at Treeport Fire Department per month, that is spread over a continuum of many, many providers that can do them. And so as a service, we're doing well. As an individual, we don't get that many. So most hospital providers are unlikely to achieve and maintain those success rates without ongoing training and practice. So one of the examples that they use as a training model for RSI in the pre-hospital setting is the Fairfax training model that has an additional in, intense and um, advanced class with a small group of previously experienced personnel that concludes with verbal, like an oral board and written assessment to verify competency. Following the training, there's a three day retraining every six months to a year with 20 to 40 intubations per year that are logged via simulations or inpatient encounters. All RSI and intubations are reviewed by the medical director and part of the QM process. And the final result is a small number of highly trained experienced personnel, which is existing, um, excuse me, which corresponds with the most existing evidence confirming that the better res results are with the increased experienced personnel and for uh, the number of intubations that they do practice. It doesn't have to be on human bodies, just so long as they get the muscle memory and are trained in how to troubleshoot. So speaking of that, there is no universal rapid sequence innovation protocols. There's some really great ones out there and then there's some watered down ones. But the consensus is, again, that a small group of highly trained individuals is the most evidence driven method to ensure that you have high quality first attempt success with RSI. So who should have an RSI perform? Well, RSI is an individualized selection of patients. Not everyone should get it. And you have to take into account hemodynamic stability to include, do I need to give this patient volume? Do I need to give this patient a push dose epi or start them on a presser? As well as since this is needed, um, because hypotension is directly linked with increased mortality and morbidity of patients that get RSI. Ultimately, RSI has the potential to improve success and select patient outcomes. And so knowing when to use it and what tools to use within it is very important. And this is not just a quick you know, cookbook. This is you have to critically think about what you need to do to prepare during or before, during and after um, the intubation. What makes RSI effective? Well, it must be implemented as part of a comprehensive departmental program. You can't just say, all right, we're going to do RSI today and roll it out. It has to have training management, uh, management training, fleet um, training, and medical buy-in from the bottom, which is the line, all the way up to senior administration within the department on every single call that this is done in order to make sure that we have um, continued quality improvement and identify errors to protect patients protect you and your patch and protect the department. So let's go into call number two, uh, Jane Doe, she's 52. She has complaints of shortness of breath and she has a cardiac arrest. The patient, the paramedic is unable to intubate the patient since the patient has a rigid jaw. This is very um, common when it comes to why we would need to do RSI for a medical patient, especially in the department. And so let's talk about the primary insurer right here. Going back to AMLS's um, thing, you notice we took away X for exsanguination, which is present in PHTLS. You have airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. And you see here the patient is pooling secretions in the posterior throat. This is pathomnemonic for needing a RSI. What does pathomnemonic mean? That means that this, if you see this, this means the disease is present. You must intubate this patient. Putting the patient with a BVM and just, you know, pushing air in is not it. We have to do something to protect the airway. This is true airway failure. Breathing, she has bilateral breath sounds. You have an MPA and a BVM because you can't close or can't open the mouth. She has absent pulses, no obvious trauma, and no obvious bruising or signs of infection. And here we see Mima. whenever you get on there, she's got um, pills by her side. I wonder what that's for. 
Um, maybe this is an overdose. Maybe something's going on. This is when we start needing to think about our H's and T's. Does she have any pop medical problems? Does she have a medical alert bracelet on? We don't know. So again, when you go in here, you're the medical detective and having trying to resuscitate her. So what's your primary field diagnosis? Well, she's in cardiac arrest. She's got a rigid jaw. She's in airway failure. What do you need to do? CPR, IV or IO within 90 seconds, making sure that you get that first epinephrine there. Make sure you got your pads on. Make sure you, if you have a ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation or torsades, that you shock them, um, that you continue doing ACLS, and that you try to provide oxygenation to the patient. Because remember, once we go to CPR, it's C-A-B-C, compressions, airway, and breathing. And so therefore, we need to make sure that we are taking our time. And just like in AMLS and PHLS, if you come to a stop where you have an air, C, we're good with that. We can do compressions. A, uh-oh, we can't get that mouth open. So what do you need to do? This patient would be a great, qual um, a great candidate for RSI. And so therefore, would this patient need any type of automate or fentanyl or ketamine, which we'll go in a minute? The answer would probably be no, they're unconscious. You need to paralyze them. And so using a short-term paralytic like succinylcholine would be appropriate. Again, this is not a cookbook. You have to cr think critically about what needs to be done. What's the determination for disposition? Well, obviously, once you are getting the patient going, you know, going to the department's protocols that the patient has rhythm changes and whatnot, then we can transport if the patient has no rhythm changes, you have a stable airway, and you're doing all the things with capnography, then that might be a candidate for field termination if appropriate. So let's talk about traumatic brain injury in RSI for a moment. So in 2013, they did this study in South Africa to look at what happens when someone has a traumatic brain injury and we intubate them. Well, they found out that of the patients that did have TBIs, most of them were intubated with sedation, over 50%. And then about 30%, the next largest goal was basic airway management. And that means OPAs, MPAs using a bag valve mask. Um, only 7% were actually used with RSI. Now you'll notice that RSI and sedation are two separate things. Sedation is just using the induction agent or Versed or some type of anxiolytic versus RSI, which we use the paralytic, succinylcholine or rocaronium. And so therefore we found out that a lot of them were just being managed with just giving them a little sedation and then putting them to sleep. Of the positive outcomes, they found out that people who used basic airway management, uh, we had good 73% positive outcome, but the failed intubation, one intubation that's failed, you had a 64%. Now, this is a little misleading, and let me look at this, 74 and 62, you're only talking about roughly a 9% difference, so it's not cataclysmic. So don't, this is an example with statistics, don't look at this chart and say, oh my God, there's a huge difference. Yes, it is statistically relevant, um, but at the same time, you're only talking about 8%. Now, there was another slide in this presentation that showed you what happened when you did an RSI and then when you had someone who had no gag reflex. Well, if they already don't have a gag reflex, that indicates that their brainstem is injured. And so those patients are going to be hard off to begin with. And so no matter what you do, they may have a poor, poor morbidity and mortality outcome. So going into the suggested pathophysiology of TBIs, so based on the rationale that early aggressive airway management reverses the problematic effects of hypoxia, it would be reasonable to expect that RSI actually has a positive impact on TBI. But what was demonstrated in 2010 was that RSI by paramedics and head trauma increases the risk of favorable neurological outcomes at six months. But a couple of years later, in a small retrospective study, small meaning that it wasn't a multi-center trauma um, you know, review, they showed that there were adverse outcomes following RSI. So it's, it's a seesaw. Is it good? Is it bad? But what we did find out was adverse outcomes following RSI was um, found because of the fact that when the brain is damaged, it's very sensitive to lower high oxygen, lower high CO2, you're bagging them too fast, you're bagging them too slow, or blood pressure lower high. And so therefore, you have a very narrow window to provide care for this patient because of the fact that if you start deviating from those, those times or those numbers, those ranges, you will expose the patient to problems and that patient will suffer the consequences as a result. So if you do an RSI with a traumatic brain injury, you have to make sure that everything is modified and clinically managed to a point where you have medically optimized them for this procedure. 
So everything else that we do for the most part is medical. And so medical is really the, um, the part here that we're mainly talking about. Traumatic uh, RSIs are unique. We do have a lot of trauma here, but at the same time, the medical RSI is going to be the, um, the bread and butter. Now in 2017, they did a large retrospective analysis, meaning they looked in the past, looked at the records, and they saw about the outcomes for RSI and paramedic driven RSI for illnesses over the age of seven. And what they found was, is that since the mechanisms through RSI differ and they impact mortality and morbidity differently, uh, they don't realize, they didn't come to a conclusion that there was a strong indication for RSI for all of the rationales that it's currently utilized for. So what does that mean? Again, there is no strong A, strong A. It's a select group of highly trained individuals that are trained on a regular basis, both in person on people and out of person in training and models. In addition to that, these individuals will be able to select a group of individualized patient cases that they may require it. So again, more to come on this. This is an exciting area for the department, um, but we need to make sure that if we do deploy it, that the training is rock solid, that the decisions are made and documented appropriately. And so that is what we're going to do. Now, let's look at a model RSI procedure. Now, I just wanna make a comment right here. This is where the intubation happens. Look at all the things that you have to do before RSA happens. Preparation is key. So going to the patient preparation side right here, we have pre-oxygenation with a nasal cannula and a bell valve mask. You put the nasal cannula in and you bag them. So if you have a king tube in or something like that, you know, that patient doesn't have a gag reflex, that would not be a candidate for RSI. Instead, this is a patient that you can't open the mouth all you have to go for is a non breather with a, uh, and you can put bilateral uh, MPAs in, put the nasal cannula on, and then try to push the uh, bag valve mask and push the air through the teeth um, if they're locked up. Um, also, if they're medically failing and whatnot, you need to pre-oxygenate them. And some services have the three, two, one rule, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that three minutes is a pre-oxygenation before you do any airway interventions yet. Hemodynamics, you have to consider, is this patient fluid down? Do they need IV fluids? Push dose saline, getting your syringe and just injecting um, saline. Vasopressors, eventually um, with the push dose epinephrine or levofed. Um, positioning, making sure that you push that patient in the ear to sternal notch, that you have them in a good ramping position, that if they have a trauma, that you have a person holding C-spine while you manipulate the mouth and with an open collar so you can manipulate that area. Apneic oxygenation, which is that pre-oxygenation with the nasal canyon. We'll see that in another slide here. And then monitoring. Look right here. Pulse ox opposite of the blood pressure. Commonly, we put the pulse ox on the blood pressure cuff arm. And so you can see here that whenever you're doing your intubation, if you have a blood pressure cuff inflating every two to five minutes, your pulse ox is going to go low. And then people who look at that are going to say, well, did they have good oxygenation? Did they have good placement? What's going on? And so you need to make sure that you are uh, not putting your foot in it, so to speak, and instead you are taking the best steps to make sure that you are getting good data and that you are documenting the good work that you're doing. And so we go over here to considerations. Does the patient have risk for hypotension, sepsis, hypo, or hypovolemic shock, hemorrhagic shock? Do we have any type of reason that we would need to include the hemodynamic considerations for the preparation? What's the shock index? We don't really use the shock index very much, but it is a good tool. Um, what that is, is it's a number that you get from a value from commonly used vital signs that the, the number value that you get indicates to you the risk of patients de decompensating in front of your eyes due to shock. Um, do we have a risk for desaturation? Is there going to be an aspiration risk? Are they going to vomit inside the oral pharynx whenever you um, relax the esophagus with your medications? Do we need to set an SpO2 limit? COPD and asthma patients have different limits than uh, regular patients. And so again, you need to figure out, what do I need to do? This is not a cookbook. Do we have pH considerations? The patient's in DKA, or are they retaining a lot of CO2 so they're acidotic? How do you adjust that? Are you When you intubate them, now you have to think about 
How fast am I going to breathe? How much am I going to breathe for him? Do I use a vent if I have one available? Again, after you've considered all of these things, that's when you verbalize the airway plan. You are a super medic when you can RSI. This is one of the most dangerous things that you can do as a paramedic. And I've mentioned paramedic, paramedic, what is an EMT doing this? Well, the EMT is helping them get ready. You can see here in the setup area right here, we have the laryngoscopes. It, when we get, um, when you have access to video laryngoscopes and you have direct laryngoscopy with what we're traditionally used for, you got to get all that out. You got to get the endotracheal tube above and below the size that the paramedic wants to use with a syringe attached. Make sure you test the cuff. Make sure the cuff is lubed up. If, um, when you do it, you got to have your bougie ready or your um, some type of stylet, and then your suctions have them ready to go your BBM with PEEP attached so that you can provide that positive um, end expiratory pressure, getting your end-tidal CO2 up ready to go both from the mask um, portion whenever you're pre-oxygenating now to your endotracheal tube, have your superglottic rescue available, your eye jelly, your king, and then your surgical airway that you haven't been, been trained on yet, how to do a knife finger bougie technique and be able to recover when you have a situation where you can't ventilate, can't ventilate and you're in failed airway. You need to pre-medicate. So what does that mean? That means atropine for kids, lidocaine for ectopy if you need to, fentanyl for um, pain, also induction. You can have atomidate, fentanyl, versed, ketamine, paralytic, succinylcholine, which is your short acting, and rocaronine, which is your long acting. Then your post innovation sedation, fentanyl or ketamine, or if you have propofol available, and then fluids. Do you need to give them fluids or pressures because you dropped them as you stimulated them with your intubation? So lots of things. This is a whole thing in itself. Um, and this is why it's not feasible to roll it out to an entire department that doesn't have close follow-up and training. So what do you do? Well, after you've intubated, you confirm the placement just like we do with any tube. Look at the waveform, listen to the lung sounds, listen to the belly, secure the endotracheal tube, Make sure that if you have post innovation, uh, you know, post innovation uh, paralysis ongoing with your rock, that you're monitoring the patient to see if they're becoming quote light as the uh, sedation is wearing off, that you give them the sedation and pain control, and that this, consider paralysis it would not be an appropriate thing in the pre hospital setting unless absolutely necessary. You don't want to continue paralyzing the person, you want to sedate them. And then putting an OG or NG tube in um, to make sure that you remove the contents of the stomach and reduce the risk of aspiration even more. Sit the patient up, especially with head injuries at 30 degrees, and then reassess the patient every five minutes. So lots of things, kind of overwhelming, but that's okay. I mean, this is this is an RSI procedure. Now here's what you do inside, and we've talked about this. Remember, this is the most important part of the sign right here. The airway procedure algorithm, this is for anything. And th we should be doing this anyway um, whenever we do not have RSIs. You do your first laryngoscopy with an optimized attempt. What does that mean? Pre-oxygenating, ear to sternal notch, adequate sedation if possible. You use your direct or your VL um, insertion and making sure you go into the right area, see the right things. They, they say to use a bougie. I know we don't use a bougie. We have the, the tube directly in, um, but that most services use a bougie loaded up with the um, endotracheal tube so that you have more manipulation. Um, and then your external laryngeal man manipulation, the burp, backwards, upwards, rightwards, pressure movement, head elevation, jaw thrust, and then your the head elevation is the ramping. And then you use the MAC as a miller, which means you go deep and then you pull back. Um, the second attempt is if you fail that first one, then you go to another blade. So you don't use the MAC continuously expecting you to have a different result. You want to go to the miller. And I know that that's a complex skill because that's not a go-to. Everyone learned on the Mac, um, but this is an opportunity for you to optimize that attempt and see if you can't perform with a different blade with the, a different result, which would be success. If you fail, you go to a supraglottic airway. And the only time that you should go to a surgical airway is if you have a failure to intubate, failure to ventilate. And if that's the case, you have to access the trachea directly. Um, through the cricothyroid membrane with the knife finger bougie technique. So pre-medication, we mentioned some medications already. Ketamine is a go-to for induction and post-innovation. It's great. Um, if you don't have access to ketamine, then it's Atomidate, Fentanyl, Versed, or Ativan. Um, you can use Rock and Sucks. 
Sucks is usually about one to two milligrams per kilogram. Um, and so they say max of 150. You have certain contraindications to succinylcholine, and this would be um, a trauma after a couple of days, burns a couple of days. So when you learned about succinylcholine, all the bad things, it's not like, I got burned, I can't use sucks. It has to be a time frame with that. So lots of stuff, um, and here you see the shock index heart rate over um, systolic blood pressure, and greater than eight means a high risk for hypertension. So you wanna be able to um, pre-medicate with fluids or pressures before that time. So let's move on out of the semantics of an RSI and talk a little bit about how personnel for assistance makes a difference. You know, in a traditional fire EMS crew staffing, you have anywhere from four to eight people present. And so the more hands can be better, but sometimes that can be an impediment. If you have a lot of people that want to control the situation, it becomes difficult for one person to be the team leader. And so that team leader needs to be the person that can not only help guide what's going on, but also direct the right path to go on, especially with an RSI. That individual has to be the one that is certified and ready to go um, to make sure that they give the right information at the right time. Now, a traditional EMS crew staffing is usually two, maybe three people at times. And these folks are going to be by themselves doing a lot of these things by themselves. And this is where you become that intimate crew contact where you can do things somewhat with telepathy. And, you know, they already know what you think, you know, know you know what they think and they just do it for you. So this can be also detrimental if you have a new partner. And so again, um, there are different different pros and cons to each. And then in the emergency department staff, you can have upwards of 30 people in the room the size of a matchbox. So again, more people does not equal more assistance. Make sure that you do a little bit of scene control if necessary. So bridging the gap between the pre-hospital hospital setting is vital to improving emergency medicine and trauma. And so the, we mentioned before about physiological problems, hypo, hypertension, um, bradycardia, tachycardia, um, hyper or hyperoxia, and hypo or hypercapnia. This is really important during RSI because those need to be monitored at precise intervals. And there are, are limited personnel present to assist with this procedure sometimes, which can make it a challenge if things go awry. Just a quick note about apneic oxygenation. The desarge saturation dilemma that we talked about before prompted the development of this technique where you put the nasal cannula on, you leave it on during intubation, you just rip it off because that providing um, the passive oxygenation through the nasopharynx helps to push and move some of that dead space out um, and help you get the stable saturation during the procedure. So what's the bottom line? Um, at its creation in the pre hospital setting in 1996 in San Diego, um, it's far removed from the original descriptions of the procedure. And the principles were rapid delivery of the definitive airway and avoiding aspiration are still highly relevant. Um, and the indications for RSI still remain relatively unchanged. But changes to the procedure have tackled several considerations that weren't as apparent, such as apneic oxygenation and reducing the frequency of failed intubation with portable video laryngoscopes and slipstream end titled capnography. But the remarkable consensus in RSI practice that persisted for many, many years has actually decreased over time, even among standardization in many systems. So one consistency in high performing systems is the recognition that the delivery of high quality RSI is not a solo activity and requires an effective team approach to apply the appropriate techniques on the right patients. The safety of RSI is as important now as it was when we first described so many years ago, and it's carried out on our sickest and most unstable patients in the emergency treatment phases. So choices of drugs and techniques have increased, which have complicated the process a little bit, which was once a simplistic recipe, and they're trying to go back to it. For those of you who've heard the 3-2-1 rule, like I mentioned before, three minutes of pre-oxygenation, two milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, and one milligram per kilogram of rocaronium, you remove a lot of the guesswork and the work, but at the same time, you remove the clinical decision process that's vital for the um, potential safety and improvement of patient outcome with these patients. So what is the bottom line? Ultimately, there is no bottom line. The consensus is that a trained provider that continually undergoes training is essential to a successful procedural outcome, no matter if it's a paramedic, an anesthesiologist, or emergency room physician. The capacity to perform life-saving airway interventions is augmenting with training and practice. The more knowledge and preparation, the better the technician is equipped to influence outcomes, good or bad. 
And that completes this month's CE. I hope you learned some things. We talked a little bit about, you know, RSI and we talked, we did our patient, patient evaluations. You know, one of the big take home points that I want all my um, EMTs and AMTs to walk away from this is, is that you have a vital component in this. You are the one doing all of the prep work. If you notice in the RSI, all of those things are prep. You got your equipment, you got your oxygenation, you got your patient positioning, you got all those things. And so making sure that we do that as preparation is vital to assisting the next chain in the survival, which would be the paramedic on scene. So making sure that we work as a team, we practice as a team is also vital to make sure that we are prepared when seconds count, they can count on us. All right, well, that concludes this month's CE. If you have any questions, I appreciate the opportunity to um, present these topics to you, and I look forward to any of those questions you may have. All right, well, thank you.